Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... It was the first time someone came out for a female lead in a television show. It was so important. Um, you know, we all knew that Ellen was gay. I had forgotten the bomb threats and the dogs sweeping the studio every tape night um, where we would all clear the stage and they would make sure that someone wasn't going to bomb us. It was, um, you know, the world off its axis for, for everybody. You know, it was, um, you know, the world lost Princess Leia. I lost my mentor, my mirror, um, you know, and my, my big sister. Growing up in showbiz like today's guest did is a smidge different than how most of us were raised. Finding your path when your parents are Hollywood royalty can be interesting. And what do you do when your big sister is an actual princess from a galaxy far, far away? Well, you forge your own path, co-starring on a groundbreaking and eventual controversial comedy series. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, actor Jolie Fisher. Hi, Jolie. Thanks for coming in. Hi, Steve. I appreciate it. You know what I thought about when I was first reading up on you is you were born in a trunk, weren't you? I was. I call, I call it the fishbowl. Um, your father was Eddie Fisher. Yes. Your mother is Connie Stevens. They were both big household names yeah. at one time. I, I, I kind of like, I call myself carny folk. Um, but, and my mother always called me the gypsy because I would rather be on the road than be home in school with people my age and doing appropriate things that small children should be doing. <laughs> Well, if you don't learn appropriate things, it's hard to learn inappropriate things. It's true. <laughs> well, they you have go to be carefully hand. taught. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, one of the things I'd like to ask you about Ellen, you were working on Ellen when uh, all the stuff came out about her being gay. Do you remember what that was like at that time about uh, all the uproar? And she was on, what was it, Time Magazine, the cover of Time? and. Yeah, I often say, you know, it was so great of Ellen to be the star of my show. You know, like I had the time of my life. I was on a magic carpet ride um, and people were coming up and saying, you know, oh my God, it's the show's so great. We, You're my favorite. And I was, okay, whatever. Um, and when you and Ellen were on the fence at the, at the spa, oh my God, you know, like they would actually recite lines from the show and talk about the, the bestie Paige Clark. And we went to do the talk show um, 20 year on the 20 year anniversary of the coming out of us I think it was 20 years and it was Laura Dern who played you know the object of, of her affection mm -hmm. in the coming out episodes Oprah who played her shrink, shrink right and then the cast um and we talked about what an impact it had on so many lives around the world I mean it was um, you know, it was the first time someone came out for a female lead in a television show. It was so important. Um, you know, we all knew that Ellen was gay. Um, they tried to, to write it so that it was, you know, palatable for the world to watch this female comedian and, you know, and her dating life and whatever. And then they kept um, talking about it. Like, are we going to, is she going to come out on the show? You're like, what's, is it going to happen? And she went to a meeting. I remember very, very distinctly. And she went to a meeting and um, they, she came back and her face was red. And I knew that she had been emotional and she's like, we're going to do it. And she said, she felt like she was a, a bird let out of a cage. And I could see it in her, in her gait and in her everything in her essence. And I was I knew that it was going to be something that was important. I knew it was going to be important. It had to be funny. It's a sitcom, you know? And we started to, oh, they went to, she went to a meeting and I think it was Mike Ovitz and Michael Eisner were the heads of Disney at the time, me and Mo. And they were like, can't she just get a puppy? Can't she just get a puppy? So the coming out episode became the puppy episode. So here's, we would joke all along the whole season. Here's where Ellen's going to get the puppy. Um, I loved the way that my character was written because she represented um, a lot of people. Like it's not just, everybody's not going to go, great, you're gay. I'm awesome. I'm going to accept that. 
mine my character was like i'm gonna have to like kind of live with this for a beat because you're my best friend and i feel like i maybe it's been a lie all this time so i got to represent people in the country that were like oh let me just see how i feel about this and and then the next season got soapboxy and unfunny i felt it sort of became something that um uh america didn't want to see um but personally i did see and i had forgotten when we went on the talk show i had forgotten the bomb threats and the dog sweeping the studio every tape night um where we would all clear the stage and they would make sure that someone wasn't going to bomb us um and it was very very dark and i think uh, um that ellen i remember being at her house and she was involved with Anne Hache still at the time and there was press outside the door and I was like calling Chris and I was like, I think I'm going to stay over because it seems a little dangerous over here. And she was hysterical and my career's over and then we all know what happened. <laughs> it wasn't really over. No, it wasn't. It got even bigger. Yeah. Is it your half-sister or stepsister was Carrie Fisher? Mm -hmm. Half-sister. Half-sister. Did you just call her? She was just your sister, really. Yeah. I mean, I say nothing half about it. Um, we do. We have different moms. Her mom was Debbie Reynolds. Um, a funny story is we were, you know, in financial sort of disarray, which was often times in this world. You know, you're not always in, you know, in the chips. And we rented our big house um, out to Herb Alpert um, in, in, uh, Homeby Hills and went to go look for a house. And my mom found one in Malibu. And uh, she said, I, uh, you know, let's, let's go live, you know, let's go live on the beach, my beach. And, um, we rented a house for a year next door to Flip Wilson. His two daughters became our best, best of friends. And we decided we wanted to stay. So we went looking for another house and, you know, it was back when there weren't tennis courts on the beach and things like that. There, there, there are now apparently, um, but we were on Carbon Beach and we walked out onto the deck of this little sandy, sort of salty little beach house. And my mom looked over and she's like, who's the asshole who has a swimming pool on the beach? And the real estate agent laughed and said, Debbie Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> so we bought the house and we grew up next door to, to Mama Debs and uh, my, my half brother, Todd Fisher. And Carrie would visit from time to time, but that was just in the height of like, Star Wars and all of the, the the stardom that she was beginning to to encounter. One time she came over with um, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, and they all wore sunglasses and didn't say very much. And you know, one could only assume. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we thought, oh, this is great. Eddie can come over and visit and see us all in one fell swoop. So he did one time, <laughs> and we have a picture of it, but it was a Polaroid, and now we can't find it. You know, I have so many questions to ask you. This is not going to be a linear interview. Yeah. I'm going to jump around uh, because that's the way my brain works these days. Um, you must miss Carrie a lot. I do. Do you? Yeah. It was, um, you know, the world off its axis for, for everybody. You know, it was, um, you know, the world lost Princess Leia. I lost my mentor, my mirror, um, you know, and my, my big sister, um, my, my daughters call her big auntie, although she was much, much smaller than me. Um, and I would send her things to read and, and get her notes, which she was, you know, immaculate in her notes and funny and the best brain that I ever knew, you know, um, it ignited in me a writer and that was quite, um, cathartic for me to sort of um, I think it's like our Fisher way to to write it all down and to deflect with humor and um, yeah, it was it was a tough thing. It was a tough um, moment in time. I 2016 sucked. Okay, my mom had a stroke and my sister died, and then her mother died the day after. I mean, it was a mess. So I took it all very personally. <laughs> And decided that um, I didn't want to be swallowed up whole by it, although I did get my grief on. I really did. And I, 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 not regretfully, because I think it's important to process grief however the body and the mind and the soul and the heart feel it. Just do it, you know. 
Um, but I, I do regret sort of not pulling it together for my daughters a little bit. So they, the three of them, you know, very young age sort of saw me come apart at the seams and then go, I'm going to put this back together again. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a book. I'm going to do a one woman show. I'm going to, you know, I mean, just probably the way Carrie would have done it where Connie would have done it. Debbie would have done it. You know, we're all sort of cut from the same cloth. So, um, that would, you know, that was, it was tough. We did, we moved around a bunch. Um, but it's all in my book, uh, which I forgot to bring you. That's okay. There's other ways. Yeah. Um, Carrie had a brilliant mind. Sometimes I'm, I, I, I remember I had to interview her for Postcards from the Edge, mm. and I was nervous about going to do the interview because she's so she was so sharp and her vocabulary. The one-liners. Yes, uh, I, I just felt rather intimidated. Um, yeah. She wrote a lot about your father as well, from her viewpoint, from her standpoint. Um, was any of that difficult to hear or read? She talked about his addiction and oh God, no, things of that nature. No, no? I, I, I knew about. I mean, well, let's say I didn't know about, but I didn't grow up with my father. She said that you know, well, like, can we use bad language on this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> she says he fucked Debbie and left them. I don't remember him ever being in the house, so I don't feel that way. I never felt that way. Although I was reading his book, which he spelled my sister Trisha's name wrong. <laughs> he got the date wrong. He married Terry Richards on my birthday without realizing that it was my, I mean, all this stuff. And then I opened to a chapter and I said, mom, were you not married when I was born? So this is a little girl saying, you know, can't, tell me the story. Like, do I have to read it in the pages of, of my dad who's high writing a book who doesn't remember anything and making shit up? Um, I, Carrie thinks that he was undiagnosed bipolar. I think that he was a child who grew up and and had this big voice and ha and performed and supported a family. And they realized that if he sang, people loved him, mostly ladies. Um, and became, you know, uh, you know, he was doted on by his mother. He, um, but he didn't understand, um, parenting at all. Like he didn't, it was like an ego trip. And so when I was 16 years old, I was going away to school in Europe and I said, I'm going to go stay with my dad for two weeks before I go. And my mom's like, well, you might want to call him. Um, and ask and because the only times I'd ever seen him he took brought he came once to take Trisha and I to a baseball game <laughs> which we were like we really love that but it was time to spend with our dad and he showed up in a wi big white Cadillac and we got into a car accident and never went to the baseball game we got returned home immediately one other time we were like 12 and 13 he picked us up and we were going to go spend the weekend with him with his new wife, Terry Richards, who was Miss World something or other. And um, we got into a plane to go to like Palmdale Lancaster that was piloted by Rudy Untertheiner, who was his plastic surgeon slash dealer. So we get into a plane. My mom's like, I didn't know you got into a plane. What do you mean? <laughs> Um, and we went to, you know, there was cocaine and there was stuff and there was silk sheets and a round bed. And we were like, what are we doing here? And I think probably Eddie thought the same. You know, what? why do I have my children here? So at 16, I invaded his life. I went to stay in his apartment. I kind of folded my arms and I was like, try to bother me, you know. But I laughed and he was um, super generous. Uh, he was freaked out. And from then on, I had a relationship with him. And when he died, I didn't realize how hard that was going to be for me. But and we went and we had a little, um, a little memorial service, kind of. You know, my father should have had something grand and didn't. And my mom said, "Let's go to Factors and have bagels and in Eddie's honor." And my sister, Trisha Lee, and I made a slideshow. <laughs> of all these beautiful photographs of us with our father. And my mom sat back and she's like, you spent a lot of time with Eddie. I didn't realize how many moments you actually had with him. And then Carrie 
showed up a little bit late. And the three of us read something that we had written about our father. And um, each of us said that we were his favorite. We, nobody knew that we were all writing something. And I think it's because at one point in our lives, he made us feel that way. So, it, you know, I do attribute to him. I also let him have it in my book and in my show. Um, so, uh, somebody said to me, when you write a memoir, there's no new information. It's all stories that you've told, stories that you've heard. It's just a new way of, of telling it, um, you know, on the paper. Um, but I, and then they said, write like everybody's dead, which not everybody was, he was. Um, so I, I am honest. What did you say to me on the phone the other day? You left blood on the page. <laughs> I had an editor who said, I need you to bleed more on the page. <laughs> so I immediately did. <laughs> well, it's kind of good advice. It's hard to do. Yeah. If people are still alive. Yeah. There's a, there's one pass that's like a legal pass where they're like, this will get you into trouble. This will get you in trouble. And it was like maybe three spots. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back for more in a moment. We went outside by my mom's pool, and it was Diane, Connie, Lainey, Shelly Winters, and Renee Taylor in their bras and underwear swimming in, the, in my pool. How's your mother doing? She's okay. She's okay. I like to spend a Sunday with her. We like to get her up, and, you know, she's still... She's still with it. Um, she never really recovered from her stroke, really. And then the decline of, like, not being good to your body, which, by the way, like, a reminder to all, like, it's important to stay out of the sun. It's important to hydrate. It's important to eat right. It's important to exercise and to laugh and to spend time with people that you love because it's short. It's short. So she's, she struggles, um, but she lights up when any of us come in the room and her, she has eight grandchildren and she loves that. She's in assisted living? She is, yeah. That kind of helps the mind. My mom was in assisted living for a number of years prior to her death and Put your mind at ease a little bit. You know that they're being taken care of, at least. I mean, her, she's been there like a year and a half. We finally said we can't have her in the house by herself. She's going to fall. She's going to, something's going to happen. And, um, but also we were racing to emergency rooms, like quite a lot. And, you know, my sister, Trisha and I, we would be like, all right, you got this one. I'm over here. You know, like we, it became like a, a full time job and white knuckling the 101 across the valley to see if we were, you know, needed. And um, and we have the blood pressure is good. The, you know, things go wrong. They go wrong. You know, it's that age. But we haven't had a trip to the ER. You know, there are people there all the time keeping her safe and and can be to be a companion for her. right um what are you doing career-wise these days i am um it's been a little bit of a rough go a couple of years of um you know as we were talking about earlier this little global health crisis we had really sort of knocked me on my ass and um we fortunately had a space where all like all of us in the family could come and like take our space in the house and like you know not kill each other um i have a lot of children so we were dealing with a lot of and none of us are the same sign so imagine that in a house and so i wrote like a crazy person i wrote four pilots I wrote, I continued to hone my one woman show. And so um, the one that has risen as the cream in the crop uh, is a, it's a very meta pilot where I play myself. It's a little bit curb. It's a little bit, um, Matt LeBlanc did a show called Episodes, which I was a huge fan of where he played himself. So it's a dark look at, you know, Jolie Fisher, 
not my real family all around me, but that's the one that I shot right before the strike. And so I'm out with that right now. And in the meantime, saying yes to guest stars and and all kinds of things that will help me get my insurance, quite frankly, because that was a mess. Um, and I'm putting aside, a little bit aside, my union duties, which became really, really um, important to me and really um, personal, but also like I felt like I was the mother of 160,000 people out there. The health plan for SAG-AFTRA, when the two unions merged, we knew it wouldn't sustain. We wouldn't be able to take care of everyone. And in 2020, there was a contract that was going out that would kick seniors off the health plan, including Shirley Jones, Leslie Ann Warren, Elliot Gould, Connie Stevens, lifetime members that have paid into union pension and health. My mom's a 69 year member, maybe t this year will be 70. Like, how dare you? So I was like, I'm fired up about this. I'm gonna run for office. And I did, <laughs> and I won. <laughs> um, and it has been really important to me and- The elections have consequences. <laughs> they do. Um, and then, you know, it's very, I don't know, this isn't interesting for the audience, but it's very political. It's like a little microcosm of the country in our union. It w you wouldn't think so. Like, we're all actors. What do we care? Like, just put us on a set. Show us our marks. Light us. Make me look pretty. Um, but it's, there are lots of things. There's a reason why we're in a union. It's to take care of our performers. And, and we span many categories of performer. And... Suddenly I was like, wait a minute, our stunt people don't have as long a career as we do. Our broadcasters, they're, you know, they're taking part in, in, in voting on, on what we, you know, what we ensure our members get. So that for the past four years has been really sort of top of my mind. And, um, and I'm just getting ready to direct a movie as well. So I was like, I'm going to make sure all my kids are okay and run again for election with Fran Drescher, the nanny, who's my partner in crime. Um, Who was very visible during the strike. Very visible. And I was really the secret weapon, by the way. But <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, we came into service in sort of different philosophies. And then we decided to join forces and we ran together. So it's it's a new dawn. She says it's, you know, the 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 gold the new golden age of the industry, which actually I hope it is. You know, we have to sort of uh, find a way to harness and put boundaries around artificial intelligence, which in most industries out in the world we're like, yay, AI, science and medicine and 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 all of that. But as I sort of travel into other union circles, auto workers, nurses, um, hospitality work. I was in Vegas and like thousands of union members and we're worried about, you know, um, an iPad running a hotel. Um, so in our business, it translates into um, our likeness and and voices. our voices and, our, and mar even now our movement. They scan you when you walk in to do it mostly on the bigger movies because it's very expensive now, but it won't be forever. And so we really tried to get some language and I felt um, responsible for doing a little back channeling the night before we closed the deal and got a few movie stars and studio heads on. And I was like, we can't sign a deal without this, these couple of words in here and there. And, um, and I think we did really well, um, but it's on the horizon and it always, you know, it was, it was in, certainly in politics, you'll be fed a lot of things that aren't real. <laughs> We're being fed that now. Yes. Um, acting, directing, living, and singing. Yes. You're an alto, huh? <laughs> I'm a belta. <laughs> um, yeah, I love, I, you know, I, I don't want, like, you know, oftentimes, what would you choose? Like, what's the one thing if you had to choose one? And I'm like, don't make me choose one. If they're going to let me continue to do 
all these things until they don't then i'll do another broadway show um i am super excited and i am very emotional about going to new york next week um or whenever some week um to see the opening of cabaret which i did on broadway and um i've been invited to celebrate joel gray's 92nd birthday and see eddie redmayne in the role of the ed mc it was a part of a lifetime. I did the national tour and then went to Broadway as, as Sally, Sally Bowles. Bowles. Right. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm anxious to see this new incarnation, but also, you know, will be emotional to um, what's the next one that I, I did Greece many years ago. I'm, I think I'm ready to play Mama Rose. I think that's, I have my sights on Gypsy. That's like the summit. Right? I mean, Rizzo, Sally, Rose. <laughs> That's like the part of a lifetime. Yeah. Everybody's, uh, every, every, a lot of people have tackled that. Yeah. Uh, that'd be a, quite a legacy. Great people. Yes. Great people. Starting with Ethel. My mom said she saw her do that part. Oh, really? Yeah. She must have been really young. <laughs> um, I've also read a, something. I'm going back now. Uh, did you s fall asleep once when you were a kid, or did you sleep in the orchestra pit oh my while gosh. your mother was performing? Yes, you said you told the punchline. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I was um, I was like three years old, and we were at Harrah's Casino in Reno, and um, and we often were in the dressing room very very late, even as babies, and we had you know we had a governess mostly taking care of us while mom was on stage. But in this one evening, I disappeared. And um, my mom came off stage in her like sparkly flame sequin dress, sweaty from the night. And and they came up and they're like, we can't find the baby. And she was like, oh, that was my bad Scottish accent from the nanny. And we can't find her. We can't find Jolie. Um, and um, my mom was like, what? They were like, don't panic. And she's like, uh, what do you mean, don't panic? So they kind of, there were cops there and the orchestra and the dancers running around and their G-strings. I don't know. I'm making that part up. And um, the concert mistress, who is the first chair violin, they wore long black gowns. And she came with me in her arms with her long black gown over. And she was, shh. And so my mom woke me up and she was like, Jolie, you can't just go off like that. You have to tell someone where you're going. And I told my mom that I wanted to hear the music from the inside. And she knew. She knew it was over. Um, that it was going to be a life of wanting to hear the music from the inside. You know? And I, it wouldn't be the last orchestra pit I climbed into. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Do we want to go further with that? I don't know. Hmm. Um, you've worked with a lot of famous people, a lot of very talented people. Do you have um, people that you consider instrumental in how you do some things? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I've been cutting this show that I'm doing now where I play myself and I have been looking at there are about seven minutes of my life that are undocumented so i i found this crazy box of do you remember those little dv tapes they were like the little you know you put them in the video camera and then you could put you know whatever so i found this big box of tapes and i was like oh my god i don't know if i have the camera to play them back like how do i and i'm looking on amazon it's like a thousand dollars to get a a, car, a reader for it and I was like, oh, God. So my husband was on location and I'm, you know, I'm like, do you know where that video camera is with the little tapes? And he's like, I don't know. We've moved 13 times. I don't know. And so I open my eyes and I look up on a shelf across from my bed and the video camera is sitting on the shelf with the battery and the charger. I do not know how it got there. I think God sent it. So... I'm like, now I'm trying to find the cords to connect. Da, 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 da. So I start to look through these tapes and I'm like, this is an idea. This is my show. I'm going to show actual footage of Jolie as a child, of Jolie on stage, uh, Jolie doing benefits, 
clips of me doing sitcoms. And so I watched last night. Uh, somebody else had made a compilation of me and Brad Garrett. We did a series together called mm -hmm. Till Death for four years at Fox. And I remember, I think somebody may have been cast in it or they were talking about someone else in it and they had the same casting director that cast me in Ellen sent me the script and said, you've got to read this, it's you. And I opened up the script and I'm like, it says we've been married 23 years. I'm way too young to play this. And so, because this is, you know, almost 20 years ago now, maybe. Yeah. And um, she's like, just read it. It's television. You've been married 20 years. It's Brad Garrett. He's delicious. It'll be great. So the next day I went to a chemistry read and it was like, bam, like it was on. And um, this, I saw this thing on YouTube that somebody else put together, like Eddie and Joy, the love story. And I was like, we had incredible chemistry. Incredible, like from the get. And so I adore him for that, for bringing that out in me, that, that um, you know, he's filthy dirty, by the way. Like it was before me too. I mean, if he, if I kept saying, if you could hear the transcripts being read aloud in the courtroom, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, but we went toe to toe and I felt safe to try stuff. And then I ended up directing a few episodes and really, um, you know, just kind of honing in that comedic flying without a net. So I would say that because that's sort of recent and really impactful in what I do. Um, I mean, working with Ellen DeGeneres, obviously you could see the same thing that happened between us. And that was many years ago now. I saw on um, Twitter that it premiered 30 years ago. And I was like, okay, now I'm going back to bed. <laughs> but um, we had fun. We laughed. We laughed on that show. Um, I saw a clip of you uh, on her talk show where she had asked you to show the audience a trick with a cherry stem. Oh, yeah. I, uh, so, oh my God, I, I've been doing that for years where I, you can tie a knot and, you know, um, and then I was in, we were in Jackson Hole where my mom had a house and we're sitting at um, Chinese food dinner and Diane Ladd goes, um, you know, I used to get drinks at the bar ch tying a cherry stem into a knot. And I was like, how about we challenge <laughs> Diane Ladd? Ladies and gentlemen, can do it just like me. Um, speaking of Ms. Ladd, um, she is also in the place where my mom is, and so is Lainey Kazan. Really? They're on the sort of, it's called the um, inspired independent side. So they are still able to get around by themselves. And, um, and we have uh, actually Lainey um, and her family, we all spent Easter Sunday hanging out in the dining room together. And it's really, it's good to, and Renee Taylor is also one of the gang. And, you know, for a while there, that was the show. You know, we were I'll gonna, bet. you know, that was, it's like get these besties all together. Um, uh, my my husband, when we were dating, we've been married tw uh, almost 28 years. So that was a long time ago. Yes, they build, I think, sta erect statues to people in show business past 10. But we were dating and he came over and we went outside by my mom's pool and it was Diane, Connie, Lainey, Shelly Winters and Renee Taylor in their bras and underwear swimming in the, in my pool. That's what you should have a tape of. I mean, I wish I had that on tape. I do have some pretty <laughs> rare footage of Connie and Debbie. I have, I have some kind of David Lynch style <laughs> video of Diane. <laughs> Um, yeah, we've spent a lot of time. They're kind of my other mothers. Not that my mother wasn't enough, but, um, yeah, spectacular women who, who went through like kind of hard times in an era where, you know, you could, it, it was taboo to be single and solo and the breadwinner and all that. And to express your feelings about anything like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, I was at a restaurant once in Santa Barbara, 
um, eating outdoors with a friend, and I heard this very loud laugh and and someone a woman telling a story, and uh, I th- I said I know that voice. <laughs> And I turned around, and sure enough, it was Lainey Kazan. Yeah. She was entertaining the entire table. I'm sure. Um, it's quite a character. Um, Steve Martin, you worked with Steve Martin, right? I did. And? I, he, uh, you know, I, I actually tell this story because I think it's just a sweet story. Um, I got hired to play a small role in Nora Ephron's uh, Mix Nuts which I had to audition a few times for. And back in the day, I was just thrilled to be in a part in, in a role in a movie with all these big stars. And, um, and, um, Steve Martin played my fiance or I played his fiance, however you want to look at it. And my, my scenes were all on the phone with him. And I had my first day there and I had a a. 6am call and Juliette Lewis was there and Leah Schreiber and, um, oh gosh, there was so, the other people, Rita Wilson, and they were all getting ready to do their other scenes. And I, but I was first up, and Steve Martin came and sat and did the off camera. He didn't work that day, and I was like, wow, like I would do something like that. I I think that probably taught me to show up on time to do the off camera. I've heard terrible stories about people like. Um, you know, asking to not be there because they're turnaround and, you know, can they just do their side without me? And I'm like, why would you ever do that to another actor? It's a tennis match. It's a, it's a, it's a give and a take. And I just really was um, impressed by that. Jim Carrey. Amazing. Um, Again, I auditioned a couple of times for that small role and went to work and, this new talent, Jim Carrey, was playing, it was, oh my God, if, and I went to see these people on my first date with my husband, R.E.M. Okay, so he was playing R.E.M. really loud in the trailer, like it was like rocking, and, uh, and there was a lot of caffeine ingested, and he was funny and tried things and made me feel good, and... Um, and just that one scene and I knew he was going to be a star, you know, I was just kind of, I was only around for a day. I've had, I encountered him once uh, in an interview situation. I was amazed too by his, his mind and the speed at which he worked. Uh, he reminded me a lot of, uh, a man who I was so impressed by and so in awe of Robin Williams, Mm. you know, uh, Years later, now that I think about it, I did spend time with Jim. He was dating a friend of mine, and we spent a bit of time and played poker, and we were in Vegas at the same time. And and, um, I saw what I see often in the funniest people on the planet is, you know, sort of a dark, sort of a tragic side, or else they don't. um, But I don't know. He probably would be mad if I I called him tragic. But I think there is... um, there is that in in most of our funniest, brightest comedians that there's that stuff underneath. I know this is kind of a hard question to answer because you don't know any life other than the one you've lived. Mm-hmm. But if you hadn't done what you're doing, what do you think you would have done? Hmm. I don't think, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I mean, because I'm doing so many things now. I'm, I have so many outlets. I'm so, um, you know, it's on the page. It's on the stage. It's in my brain, in my heart. Um, I made a joke that I would be, you know, Julie McCoy, the cruise director on uh, The Love Boat. But that's sort of show business, too. Um, I do love a cruise. Uh, <laughs> um, I have yet to take one. Oh, my God. Well, I don't know about now, but. We were actually on a family cruise right before COVID. New Year's Eve, which is my anniversary, and my mom was there and all the grandkids and we were all on a cruise and I was like, we kept like washing our hands and I was like, there's crowds of people and I'm like, what if, why are we doing all, and then of course the worst happened. Um, I came out singing. I mean, I literally did. My mother was in twilight sleep in Burbank 
My father was on stage at the Frontier Hotel. Steve Wynn was a busboy clearing Tom Collins's off the table. And it was a late show. And my father was on stage and they rang him and they brought a phone out on stage as I came out into the world. And those days they used to smack you on the ass to get you to cry. And so they did. And my first sound came out over a microphone on stage in Las Vegas. So I was destined. I'll bet it got a round of applause, too. <laughs> Eddie was quelling. Um, but yeah, it was, um, I was really, you know, I went, I went to 14 schools. Not because I was a bad kid. I was never kicked out. I just was always uncomfortable. Um, That's like a, know, a different grade every school. Uh, you know, yes, sometimes two in one year. <laughs> Tenth grade I spent in two schools. Um, I just, That'll I wasn't. That'll with your head. It, 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 and it wasn't like, oh, I was a, an adult in a child's body because I was, I was an adult in an adult's body. I was already, you know, grown and curvy and smart and getting good grades no matter where I went. But I really just didn't feel like it was where I belonged very early on. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. What's I like, the most important thing to you in your life right now? I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm really, I really, I woke up on my birthday last year and I, it was very strange because I was in um, this retreat in Ojai that was kind of like, you know, festival lights and music and, um, and my husband was supposed to go with me and you get these crazy yurts out in the desert and um, he got COVID. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to still go because it's my birthday. And he was like, yeah, what am I going to do? Like sit in a mask and you're in one room and I'm in another. And I was like, and uh, so I went and, and it was exactly how it was supposed to be. I woke up on my birthday and I was like, I am going to make my movie. I'm going to do my show. I'm going to life is short the shit out of this thing right now. I am going to manifest, manifest, manifest. And it's sort of working. I'm, I'm doing what I love again. That sounds like a good place to, to go. Thank you, Jolie. <laughs> oh, one other question I wanted to ask, and it comes from the best place. Where does the name Jolie come from? Well, my mother says that she read it in a French magazine, Jolie, J-O-L-I-E, yes. J -O -L -I -E, and just changed up the spelling. My father will say that I was named after Al Jolson because he was Jolie baby and he would be on stage and he'd see uh, an empty seat in the house and he'd say, somebody died because they wouldn't have missed Jolie. <laughs> Thank you. This was nice. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Sure. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs> <laughs>